Welcome to the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. This is September 6, 2020. What do you know about being godly? The term is thrown around a lot, church apparently, and on, on media and other kinds of things. You know, what is godliness? Godliness is being like God. It's what the word means can't be like God but in behavior and attitude in other ways there's ways we can be like him it doesn't happen except to a person who is as the Bible declares it and describes it a person who is saved by the blood of the Lamb Jesus and the salvation is brought about and does its work because of God. He's the one doing it. When the human being, the sinner, the one born into this world without benefit of godliness, that doesn't come with the physical. When that person hears the gospel in their ear, it may translate into a heart thing. Very often it does not. That's why you have people who will tell you, ah, oh, I've heard that. Yeah, they've heard that. But they did not hear it in their heart. When a person hears that gospel message in their heart, the Holy Spirit convicts that person of their sin. What is their sin? They robbed a bank. No, no. Their sin is they are living aside from God. Whatever else that might mean. God is not running their life. God is not living within them. They are not one with God. And the Spirit of God convicts them that that's a serious problem. There's an emptiness here. And that sinner, having heard the gospel, responded to it, understanding a little more now because the Holy Spirit is at work in this process, he does the only logical thing. He repents of that sin. Not the lying, the cheating, the stealing, and all the rest of it. He repents of his rejection of God. And he embraces the realities of God's redemptive work. Which is what? That the first Adam, at the beginning of time, squandered his spiritual relationship with God. And that the last Adam, Jesus, paid the only price that could be paid in order to restore that relationship. That, be that believing person is immediately transformed by the Holy Spirit. Their sins are forgiven by God. This now believer is made a new creature in Christ. A new and vital relationship is established. It's an eternal relationship. It'll never leave you. Spiritual things suddenly become more understandable. And they become of primary importance. And I'm here to suggest to you that if any of these things I've just described are not present, then that person is not saved. They're not a Christian, no matter what they say or do. Doesn't matter how many prayers they've prayed. Doesn't matter how many prayers they've recited. Or how sincere they may be. We hear the gospel with our ears and with our heart. We repent of the sin that that gospel has revealed to us. Not just the individual things. Some things may come to mind, but trust me, not everything does. But it's the concept of sin, your sin, that separates you from God, that you heartily reject now. And you experience 
that change of heart that only God can effect. A change which provides a change of spiritual orientation. Recognizing the host of new desires flooding your mind and your heart. Waking up every day to this new reality, to these new relationships, to these new words, priorities, values. But the new believer is just that. He, she is new, not perfect. Not even fully understanding. But the new believer is aware that something wonderful, something fulfilling has occurred. They are embarking on a new life journey, born of the life God has given. Again, not perfectly. In the beginning, not even consistently. The old patterns are deeply embedded, depending upon how old the person is when they come to Christ. The pivotal point is repentance and belief. You've heard the gospel. What are you going to do? If you are repentant of your sin, that gospel challenges you that it's talking about you. You put Jesus on that cross. If you weren't like you are, he wouldn't have to do that. And belief that what he did paid for your sin. And you can now, from this moment forward, live with God in His purpose. The Calvinist gets it almost right. They believe that unless God does the work, no man would be saved. The Calvinist believes that it is the Holy Spirit of God who convicts the heart. And all that's true. He believes that unless the heart is convicted, it will not come, the salvation. And that's true. But he believes the Holy Spirit only convicts some, not all men. And that's where things get tricky. It's a little tricky because if you are saved, you have been chosen of God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. The Bible teaches us that those who are saved are they who have been chosen of God before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4. But the phrase is a little tricky. Since God is eternal and is not working his way through the various choices, decisions, as the circumstances might present themselves. Rather, he has purposed all things regarding this issue before he did anything else. Hebrews 4, 3. The works which were finished from the foundation of the world are now being manifested in these last times, Peter wrote, 1 Peter 1.20. We humans locked into a space-time continuum cannot fully comprehend how any of this works. But the resolution of the concept can only be found in the eternality and the omniscience of God. He knows everything. Something we don't have and we don't understand very well. The point here is there's two kinds of people on the, on the earth. Those who want nothing to do with God and those who want God more than anything else. Those who come to Christ are they whom God has called. The Bible says so. The details of which are wrapped up in God's purpose, God's will, God's pleasure. At age 15, I knew God was directing my life the day I got saved. It was not a foreign concept. I lived with parents who were saved. They had me in church as long as I can remember. But it was not something I intended to do, certainly not then. They dragged me to church on a Saturday night. I'd just been to Christian camp all week. I'd had enough church for send people. But once saved, the critical part then begins. 
And on that Saturday night, when that gospel was presented and that invitation was given, I don't believe there's any way I could have stayed seated in that pew. I can't tell you today what the feeling was or where it came from or how it worked, but I found myself up and out. And that was not me, 15-year-old kid in front of people you don't even know. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, he's talking about today, some shall depart from the faith, some, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking hypocrisy, meaning deceits, the pretending, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, not knowing, not caring how evil any of this really is. Paul's not talking about true believers. He's talking about those who are going along with the crowd for whatever reason, thinking, believing that they are Christians. They're saved because they've had an experience. But they really aren't. How do you know the difference? Well, you watch them. A person who is truly saved gets on the path and stays there. And they make progress every day, every week, every month, every year. The people who are just playing at it get on the path and they make progress. But they can't sustain it. It's not real. And their own humanity starts to enter into it. And at some point they step off to the side to slow down because it's going a little too fast here. And at some point they just stop altogether. The enemy of our soul has set up all sorts of works righteousness systems whereby to deceive and to condemn. Paul talked about it in, in verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth, seeking to corrupt those who actually believe and know the truth. In the past we had only the cults and the Roman Catholic Church as illustrations. Today the illustrations are myriad, from mainline denominations to the craziest charismatics you can think of, and everything in between, meaning the religious cults, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Name It and Claim It crowd, the Contemporary Church, and so many more are in that category, in that, that, that group of people and churches that are there not to build up the Christian in the faith, but to destroy him. They get him so busy doing all these wonderful Christian kinds of things that they don't ever do what's real. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, To wit, we are to refuse that which is profane and the old wives' fables, and, and purpose to exercise ourselves unto godliness. All that bodily exercise, the body calls it, provides no spiritual profit whatsoever. Going to church, praying a sinner's prayer, joining the church, speaking in tongues, being slain in the spirit, going to confession. None of these promise spiritual life. Not now, not in the future. Only the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has that power. And in verse 9, Paul says, This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation. So where do we begin? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says, Refuse profane, meaning godless ideas and teaching. Refuse the old wives' fables, the traditional stories, the rules, the patterns. And instead, exercise, literally practice, train yourself unto godliness, unto piety and holiness. Purpose only that, so that it becomes the pattern of your life. Why? Verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 8. Because the one is earthly, physical, and creates habits that produce nothing of value in terms of the spirit. While the other 
is godliness. The godliness of heart and mind and body. It is profitable. It's profitable for all of the above, plus anything else you can think of. The godly Christian is never at a disadvantage in the world of men. In Christ, we are promised more in this life than the unbeliever can ever hope for. Things like peace, the peace of mind and heart. You can't go out and buy that. Like every need being met, not while you sit by the lake and sip a mint julep, but by never being out of work, never being out of what you need, always having some way of getting it, other people helping, whatever it might be, getting a job, getting an education, whatever it is. And then there's the physical and the emotional stability that comes with Christ and Christianity. You take somebody who is just coming unglued in those areas, they come to Christ and over time as they start to learn and they structure their lives and they start to see ah, all this stability that they've always wanted just happens. And then there's the security of heart, the security of soul, of mind, of spirit. You don't wake up every morning and say, I don't know what's going to happen today. God's taking care of you. You belong to him. He's living within you. These are things money can't buy. Things that popularity can't guarantee. Things that wealth cannot match. Having this promise in terms of our present life as well as the life to come. What in the world can compete with that? In verse 9, Paul says clearly this is a concept worthy of all acceptation. Verse 10, but also a complex, troublesome declaration. The Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. What is that? It means the gospel has gone out throughout the whole world, is available to all men. He is their Savior. But only if they repent and believe on Him. God protects men, sustains men, delivers men. Have you not watched small children playing? <laughs> I don't know how they survive. People do not always suffer as they could. Many are protected even from themselves by the Spirit of God. But it is the believer who will experience that protection to the fullest degree. So here's a fundamental principle in our spiritual training. It's the classic put-off, put-on dynamic. Before you can begin to move in God's direction, you must forsake something else. Initially, it's sin. Sin as a concept, sin in particular. In growing spiritually, you will learn that there are other sins in your life that you didn't think were sins at all. I'm a human being. I can stop doing stuff. But putting them off is not the end. I can stop specific sinful actions and attitudes, but I must also put on godliness if I want to make spiritual progress. It's the put off, put on dynamic completed. The circle is what matters. For example, preachers make a point of telling us we need to be in church regularly. Why? Well, because putting the body there is one of those steps. It's a big step. It's not the only step. But it is there 
we are confronted with the rest of our life. The challenges from the Word of God handed down from the pulpit are stepping stones. Embrace them and you will grow. Reject them, ignore them, and you will struggle. Deny them and you will die. Physically? Well, it's possible. But certainly, spiritually, Every rejection of God's word, God's principle, God's instruction, God's declaration moves us away from what the Bible calls life, that quality of existence unique to God. So here's the training in godliness. Unless the old, selfish, sinful patterns are rejected, the new, godly attitudes, behaviors will not become the pattern. And the reality, what we say, what we do, how we respond in the moment reveals what it is that dominates our heart. This training and its training involves behaviors, but it also involves attitudes, the way you think of things, the perspectives that you have. And it all begins with the decision. The decision to repent of sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, followed by purpose, whose evidence is found in real life and real time. When? Every time. All the time. Every situation. Will there be failure? Certainly. But failure is a lesson in itself. It's a learning experience. Failure reminds us you're not perfect. You're not there. Not yet. Never allow yourself to be discouraged into quitting because you failed at something. How many times have people failed at the same thing before being able to conquer it? And the notable men and women in the world who have made these conquerings are well known for the conqueror. We don't know about the failures. But there were many along the way. The Bible says, the song says, we are more than conquerors because we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you recognized the sin in your life? Have you repented of that sin? Have you called out to God and believed that what Jesus did was, was sufficient for your sin? Have you asked him to just come and take over your life? If you haven't done that, there's no better time.